Good evening, everyone. My name is Belsie, and thank you for joining the third workshop for today. Before we start the workshop, I would like to introduce our speaker for tonight, Pastor Kim Kerr. Pastor Kim Kerr has spoken to thousands in evangelistic series all across the United States in the books of Daniel and Revelation. His in-depth seminar provides participants with a clear understanding of both ap apocalyptic books. And Pastor Kim and his wife has been working with Amazing Faith for six years and Protomate Conference for six years. Pastor Kim, he will be presenting on the book of Daniel, especially focused on Daniel chapter 9. Because this is such an important chapter when it comes to Bible prophecy and our preparation for the final conflict. So before I pass this time to pass the Kim, let's have a word of prayer. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, I want to thank you for being with us throughout the station. As we're going to enter to the next station, I ask for your continued outpouring of the Holy Spirit to the speaker to all the participants all across the world and I pray that your word can transform our heart and we will be willing to listen to your word and to accept the truth and to be humble enough to accept your words that you want to us to learn tonight. Thank you for always listening and always answering our prayer. In this name I pray. Amen. So I pass this time to Pastor Ken. Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, it's wonderful to be with you. I'm just really happy to be here and wish I could be with you in person, but uh, I guess that's not possible right now with uh, COVID and all of that and the travel problems. 
but it's just wonderful to be with you here this evening. And so let me see what uh, is going on here. Can't see your face. Yes, I understand that. Uh, the video has been, let me see if we can turn the video on. How's that? I think maybe now we're, uh, there we go. <laughs> oh. There. Okay, now we have some video. And it's wonderful to be with you this evening. Um, my privilege of, of being able to be here, and thank you so much for uh, allowing me to be with you at this conference. As we've recognized, uh, there's no turning back. We're at this point in Earth's history where we're almost to the finish line. And you know, if you get in any kind of race close to the finish line, uh, that's not the time to turn around. So here we are at this point in Earth's history, looking for the second coming of Jesus. I want to begin this evening in 2 Thessalonians. So if you have your Bibles there and you can turn with me, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and we're going to begin reading in verse 1. So 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, find that on your phones or in your Bible if you have it with you, and uh, we'll begin reading here in verse 1. There it says, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. So back in the early church, uh, people were thinking that Jesus was going to come in their day. They believed that Jesus, they were not going to die. They were going to see Jesus come. But Paul had to write them a letter to the church at Thessalonica here, had to write them a letter and let them know that it wasn't going to happen right away. So anytime they would receive some kind of, of word, some kind of letter, uh, something that would tell them Jesus is coming right away, they needed to realize that that wasn't coming from Paul. There was no vision, uh, no dream, no sermon, no book that told them that Jesus was coming in their day that Paul wanted them to regard as true. These were all false teachings. And then he gives them the reason why Jesus wasn't coming in their day. So if we begin now reading in verse 3, verse 3 says, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he, as God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. So certain events were supposed to take place before Christ would come again. There would be a falling away. And this word falling away that's translated falling away in the, in the Bible is the Greek word apostasia. It's where we get our word apostasy. So Paul is saying before Jesus would come again, an apostasy would take place. A falling away would take place. And then this man of sin, this son of perdition would come on the scene. And notice the special characteristics of this man of sin in verse 4. It says, Who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped. So opposing and exalting himself above God would be the special characteristics of this man of sin, this son of perdition. And then the next verse, Paul says, Remember ye not, that when I was with you, I told you these things. Now he's writing to the church at Thessalonica, and he's saying, don't you recall 
that we talked about this when I was with you. So they were in danger of forgetting what they had been taught back when Paul was with them in Thessalonica. Now let's look at verse 6. And no, now you know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. So Paul is saying, now you recognize what is holding back the one who is supposed to come, this man of sin, the apostasy, and then Jesus is going to come. Verse 7 says, for the mystery of iniquity is already working, doth already work. Only he who now lets or he who now hinders will let or will hinder until he is taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed. This man of sin, this son of perdition is going to be revealed. Whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Now you know the future, Paul says. Here's what's going to happen. This man of sin is going to arise, but then once he's revealed, God is going to slay him. He's going to be consumed. He's going to be destroyed with the brightness of the coming of Jesus. So this man of sin is going to oppose and exalt himself above all that is called God right up until the second coming when the Lord will consume and destroy him. And again, back in verse 5, don't you remember? We talked about these things. Don't you remember when I was with you, we have went through and explained all of these things. So let's now take a look at what Paul talked about when he was with them in Thessalonica. So if you'll turn with me to the book of Acts, Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17, and we'll begin reading in verse 1. Acts chapter 17 and verse 1, and here we find this is the time that Paul was at Thessalonica. Verse 1 says, Now when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica. That's the church that Paul is writing to there in 2 Thessalonians. They came to Thessalonica, where was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them, and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the scriptures. So Paul is going to Thessalonica. He, he finds where the synagogue is. He finds where the church is. And for three Sabbaths in a row, he reasons with them, studies with them from the Bible, from the scriptures, from the Old Testament scriptures, not talking about his own ideas, but sharing with them the word of God. Now notice in the next verse what he actually talks about. Opening and alleging in verse 3 that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead, and that this Jesus whom I preach unto you is Christ. So Paul proved that Jesus had to suffer. He must needs have suffered and then rise again from the dead. And Paul proved that Jesus was the Messiah from the Old Testament scriptures. It was present truth in their day that Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus was the Messiah, the Christ. But when we read in 2 Thessalonians, he said, don't you remember what I talked to you about when I was with you in Thessalonica? I talked about the man of sin rising. I talked about apostasy. I talked about how he would exalt himself and oppose all that is called God or uh, uh, exalt himself above God. But yet, when we look here at Acts chapter 17, when he was actually in Thessalonica, no message about the man of sin. Nothing we read here about uh, the one who would exalt himself and, and oppose God. We read about him talking about Jesus, about the Christ. 
So how can Paul say when he's writing to the Thessalonians, remember that we talked about the man of sin and, and the things that were going to happen before Jesus comes again. But then when we read the narrative, the, the account of Luke, of what he spoke there, it's about Jesus. It's about the Messiah. So how do we reconcile this? Well, Jesus explained from first uh, uh, from and the book of Acts here. Luke talks about what Paul said about the first coming of Jesus. And then when Paul writes to the Thessalonians, he says, I'm talking about the things about the second coming of Jesus. So G uh, uh, Paul is talking about both comings when he was there with them in Thessalonica, the first coming and the second coming. And in between the first coming and the second coming would be this opposer, this one who would exalt himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped. So where would this opposition, where did this exaltation of this man of sin, where did it begin? What is its origin? For that, we're going to go back to the Old Testament, back to the book of Isaiah. So if you'll turn with me in your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 14. Isaiah chapter 14, you'll find that uh, there pretty much in the middle of your Bible. Uh, find the Psalms, and then forward a little bit, and you'll come to the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 14, and we're going to begin reading in verse 12. Verse 12 says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. And verse 14 I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. So notice it says here in verse 13, he said it in his heart. He was thinking this. It wasn't open at first. The purpose was to gain control of the throne of God. So verse 13, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God, just like the man of sin I'm going to exalt myself above all that is called God. So notice now I'm going to uh, share my screen here. And uh, notice this, this quotation from uh, the Review and Herald in 1990, or pardon me, in 1908. It says, it was Satan's purpose in heaven to dethrone God and himself take the place of the Most High. So this was Satan's plan. He wanted to take over the throne of God, pull God off of his throne, and take his place. Of course, war broke out in heaven, and uh, Satan and his angels were cast out to this earth, but it didn't really alter his plans. Notice again, he that Satan, considered that to be the God of this world was the next best thing to gaining possession of the throne of God in heaven. So Satan cast out to this earth. However, uh, he didn't alter his plans. It didn't change his plans. He now said, okay, I'm confined to this earth. I'm going to take control of this earth. The next best thing to gaining control of the throne of God in heaven is to be the God of this world. And this struggle between God and Satan here upon this earth reached its pinnacle, its height at the cross of Calvary. Notice Desire of Ages, page 57. At the cross of Calvary, love and peace stood face to face. Here was their crowning manifestation. Christ had lived only to comfort and bless, and in putting him to death, Satan manifested the malignity of his hatred against God. He made it evident that the real purpose of his rebellion 
was to dethrone God and to destroy him through whom the love of God was shown. So it didn't alter his plans when he was cast out of heaven. His plan was still to dethrone God and to destroy his rival, Jesus Christ. That was his determination. Notice again, this is Signs of the Times, page, or, or pardon me, 1895. Satan determined to sit upon the throne of God in the earth, to sit in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Well, who would Lucifer, who would Satan work through here to fulfill his plans? Who would he work through upon this earth to exalt himself above God, to be able to dethrone God and place himself there as ruler of the world? Who would he work through with that? So now we just compare Isaiah chapter 13 and uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and notice the similarities here. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 said that this man of sin was going to oppose all that is called God. And from Isaiah chapter 14, we, said, uh, we see that in his heart, I'm going to ascend. I'm going to exalt. I'm going to sit. I'm going to be like the Most High. We see here the tremendous opposition that uh, Lucifer had in heaven, and it transfers through this man of sin here upon the earth. Then in uh, 2 Thessalonians, it says that he was going to exalt himself above all that is called God. We see that that was Lucifer's mindset, to exalt himself, exalt his throne above the stars of God. Then in 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 4, it says, he as God sits in the temple of God. That's what he's planning to do, wanting to do. And from Isaiah chapter 14, I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north, where the throne of God is. I'm going to sit there. And then finally, in 2 Thessalonians 2, 4, showing himself that he is God. And from Isaiah 14, Lucifer saying, I will be like the Most High. And so we find here that uh, Lucifer is wanting to do this through the man of sin here upon the earth. So Paul taught from the Old Testament scriptures that Jesus was the Messiah. So where do we see in the Old Testament, and maybe I'll just um, see how I can get rid of my, uh, my screen here and stop sharing it. Where do we see in the Old Testament uh, the Messiah as well as the opposer? From Acts chapter 17, Paul taught from the Old Testament scriptures that Jesus was the Messiah, the Christ. He also taught in 2 Thessalonians that from the Old Testament, this opposer would come and oppose Christ. It was a battle for the throne of God. So where in the Old Testament does it talk about the Messiah and the opposer and about the battle for the throne? It takes place in the book of Daniel. So let's go now to Daniel chapter 7. Daniel the seventh chapter, and we're going to begin reading in verse 2. Daniel chapter 7 and verse 2. Daniel 7 and verse 2. And there it says, Daniel spake and said, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven strove upon the great sea, and four great beasts came up from the sea, diverse one from another. So who are uh, these beasts? Who are these beasts? There's uh, several of them in Daniel chapter 7. Um, we have this lion, and of course we recognize that as Babylon. 
And then there's uh, the bear, and we recognize that as Medo-Persia. And then there was this uh, leopard with four heads and four wings. We recognize that as Greece. And then there was this terrible nondescript beast that uh, Daniel could not liken to any other beast he'd ever seen before. It had uh, iron teeth and 10 horns, etc. And of course, we recognize this as the empire of Rome. And then as he continued to watch, he saw these 10 horns come out from this beast. And we recognize these as the divisions of Rome. Now let's look at verse 8 here, Daniel chapter 7 and verse 8. And Daniel said, I considered the horns. I was looking over in that area where uh, these divisions of Rome were, these 10 horns, the 10 nations that rose out of the um, compromised uh, Roman Empire. I considered the horns. So he's looking over there in Western Europe. And behold, there came up among them another little horn. So here comes up another small horn, this little horn, before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. So as this little horn is rising into power, three horns disappear. Three horns are plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of man and a mouth speaking great things. So here's this little horn that Daniel sees rising among these other ten. He sees it having a mouth speaking great things, eyes like the eyes of man. What great empire is uh, before this little horn? Well, of course, it was the kingdom of Rome, the empire of Rome. So what does this little horn represent? Well, of course, if you've studied any uh, prophecy, gone to any prophecy seminars, you recognize that this uh, little horn here represents the kingdom of papal Rome, the Roman Catholic Church. And we always, whenever we're studying any with anyone, we always want to put out this disclaimer, I guess, if you will. And that is that uh, God is not talking here about Roman Catholic individuals. God loves everyone. The Bible makes that very clear that God is not willing that any should perish, and that he wants everyone to be saved. So God is not talking about individual Roman Catholic Christians. Uh, I know that God loves Roman Catholics because I was raised in a Roman Catholic home. Uh, much of my uh, youth was in a Roman Catholic, going to a Roman Catholic church. And of course, I know that God loves me. And so God here is talking about a system, a power that is going to apostatize, but he's not talking about individual Roman Catholic Christians. The Papal Church rose on the ruins of Western Rome, not talking about a single individual, but an office or a system of people. So Paul told those in Thessalonica, now you know. Now you know who this little horn is. So what would the little horn or what would the man of sin actually do? So that for that, we go to verse 25. Daniel chapter 7 and verse 25 says, And he shall speak great words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws. And there shall be given into his hand, they shall be given into his hand, until a time and times and the dividing of time. And so they would oppose, uh, they would oppose Jesus, they would oppose God. And notice now as we compare Second Thessalonians with verse 25 of Daniel. There it says, who opposeth and exalts himself above all that is called God. Well, that's what Daniel talks about in Daniel 7 and verse 25. He's going to speak great words against the Most High and wear out the saints of the Most High. So he's going to be opposing God. 
And then, 2 Thessalonians, he would exalt himself above all that is called God. We see that in verse 25, where he wants to change times and the law, actually attempt to change the law of God, exalting himself above God. Now we want to jump over to uh, chapter 8, Daniel chapter uh, 8, and we'll look here at a couple of verses. Daniel chapter 8 and verse 11. Verse 11 tells us, Yea, he magnified himself even to the prince of the host, and by him the daily sacrifice was taken away, and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. Verse 25. And through his policy also, he shall cause craft to prosper in his hand, and he shall magnify himself in his heart, and by peace shall destroy many. He shall also stand up against the prince of princes, but he shall be broken without hand. So as we compare Second Thessalonians now with chapter 8 here of the book of Daniel, again, he opposes all above all that is called God. And in chapter 8 of Daniel, verse 25, he's standing up against the prince of princes. He's opposing him. Then it tells us he going to exalt, he's going to exalt himself above all that is called God. Verse 11 of chapter 8, he magnified himself all the way to the prince of the host, Jesus Christ. Verse 25, he magnifies himself in his heart, just like Lucifer did, there where he said in his heart, I will ascend above the stars of God. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. But then it tells us that he's going to be broken. He's going to be broken at the second coming. Then shall that wicked be revealed whom the Lord will consume with the spirit of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. And Daniel chapter 8 and verse 25 tells us he's going to be broken without hand. And this reminds us of Daniel chapter 2, where the stone cut out of the mountain without hands. This is a supernatural thing. So he's going to be cut out, or pardon me, <laughs> the stone is cut out of the mountain without hands. Here, Daniel 8, 25, this uh, opposer is going to be broken without hand. Now we want to jump over to chapter 11. Let's look at Daniel chapter 11, and we'll notice verse 36. Daniel chapter 11 and verse 36, uh, if you just a couple of chapters over. Daniel 11 and verse 36. Here it says, And the king shall do according to his will, and he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god and shall speak marvelous things against the God of gods, and shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished. For that that is determined shall be done. Neither shall he regard the God of his fathers, nor the desire of women, nor regard any God. For he shall magnify himself above all. So now as we compare uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and Daniel 11, notice we see the same verbiage here, the same words here. Second Thessalonians 2, he opposes above all that is called God. Daniel 11, he speaks marvelous things against the God of God. So he's opposing, he's a speaking against. And then he exalts himself above all that is called God. Daniel eleven thirty six. he exalts himself and magnifies himself above every God. Verse 37, he magnifies himself above all. It's almost as if this is where Paul is quoting from. Paul quoted from the Old Testament scriptures. He said he's going to exalt himself. He's going to magnify himself. He's going to stand up against the, uh, uh, God. He's going to oppose God. He's going to present himself as God. And here we see almost the same language 
in Daniel chapter 11, as we see in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Now we want to jump back to, uh, to chapter 8. We'll go back here to chapter 8 and uh, verse 11. Daniel chapter 8 and verse 11. Yea, he magnified himself, even to the prince of the host, and by him the daily sacrifice was taken away, and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. So the little horn, as he magnifies himself, even to the prince of the host, even to Jesus, that results in casting down the sanctuary of God, the place of his sanctuary cast down. Now, why is this significant? Why this little uh, uh, horn, the man of sin, magnifies himself against the prince of the host, and then, as a result, the place of his sanctuary, the place of, of, of the prince of the host's sanctuary is cast down? Why is this significant? Back up a couple of books to the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 17. Jeremiah chapter 17. And we want to look at verse 12. Jeremiah chapter 17, and we're looking at verse 12. A glorious high throne from the beginning is the place of our sanctuary. A glorious high throne from the beginning is the place of our sanctuary. You know, as we look out into the starry heavens, this is a picture of the hole in the constellation Orion. And this is where we're told in the spirit of prophecy that Jesus is going to come from. He's going to come through this hole here to this earth. A glorious high throne from the beginning is the place of our sanctuary. So the place of our sanctuary is where the eternal throne of God sits. A glorious high throne is the place of our sanctuary. So now let's compare these verses, Jeremiah 17, 12 and Daniel 8, 11. It says a glorious high throne is the place of our sanctuary. Well, notice that the little horn was going to cast down the place of our sanctuary. And so Satan works through the little horn to cast down the place of God's sanctuary, to cast down God's throne. That was Satan's plan in the beginning. I'm going to exalt my throne above the stars of God. So the papacy is going to have Satan work through it to cast down the throne of God and to place himself. Satan working through the papal system to say, this is my throne now. I rule this earth. So as pagan Rome disintegrated in the late 400s, papal Rome took over in the early 500s. Notice from the great controversy, this compromise between paganism and Christianity resulted in the development of the man of sin foretold in prophecy as opposing and exalting himself above God. That gigantic system of false religion is a masterpiece of Satan's power, a monument of his efforts to seat himself upon the throne to rule the earth according to his will. So how is this really happening in world, the world's activities? Notice here this picture of a church in the city of Rome. This is a church called St. Paul Outside the Walls, and it's supposedly built on the tomb of St. Paul, of Paul the Apostle. You can see the vastness of, uh, of this, this church here, and to, the, to your right is a big altar. We can't see it in the picture. But notice on the uh, bottom left corner here, you'll see a seat, a throne, and this is where the Pope is sitting. So we want to 
go in and look a little closer here. So this is a close-up now of where Pope Francis is, uh, is sitting or standing right now, but where he sits on this throne. And I want you to notice some of the aspects of it. Notice that it uh, is white and also overlaid with all kinds of gold. And we're not going to take time to uh, go there, but in First Corinth, uh, pardon me, First Kings, chapter ten and verse eight, it talks about Solomon's throne, and Solomon's throne was made out of ivory, so it was white, and it was overlaid with all kinds of gold. Then, in First Chronicles chapter twenty-nine and verse twenty-three, when Solomon sat on the throne. It said he sat upon the throne of the Lord. Now in Revelation, Revelation chapter 20 and verse 12, we see there 12, maybe 11, maybe chapter, uh, maybe verse 11, 11 or 12 anyway, Roman, uh, Revelation chapter 20. We see there that God is sitting on a great white throne. And then in Revelation chapter 4 and verse 6, where the throne of God is pictured, it says that there are four living creatures around that throne. How many individuals do you see in this picture that are right there around the throne where Pope Francis is? There's four. And then if you'll notice down towards the side of the throne, you'll see two golden angels, two golden angels. Now, in the sanctuary of God, when we go into the most holy place, where the mercy seat covers the Ark of the Covenant, and then Jesus sits, or the God sits, the Shekinah glory sits there on that mercy seat, it's between two golden angels, two cherubims. This throne that Pope Francis is sitting on is a counterfeit to what God set up to sit upon the throne of God in the earth. Here again, you can see this uh, <clears throat> a picture of these angels right beside the throne of Pope Francis and uh, four individuals around. It's a counterfeit. Now we're just going to look at Exodus chapter five, uh, 25 briefly here. Notice, thou shalt put the mercy seat above the ark, and in the ark thou shalt put the testimony that I will give thee. So there's the mercy seat. That's the, uh, the judgment seat, if you will, the judgment seat of God. <clears throat> That's where Jesus sits. And then it says, the testimony is inside the ark. And in the ark thou shalt put the testimony that I will give thee. And there I will meet with thee, and I will commune with thee from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubims, which are upon the ark of the testimony, of all things which I will give thee in commandment unto the children of Israel. So there he's between those two cherubims that are upon the Ark of the Testimony, and he speaks from this seat and gives commandments from that seat. Can you notice the similarities between the throne of God that's talked about in Exodus and the throne of uh, Lucifer here upon this earth working through the papacy? But this throne, the throne of God, is the throne that we can come boldly to. It's the one when we're struggling, when we're hurting, when we just need the comfort of God, the Holy Spirit. It's the throne that we can go to, the throne of grace, where God says, I will meet you there. I will commune with you there. Our high priest is touched with the feeling of our infirmities and was in all points tempted like as we are. He's able to comfort, he's able to transform, he's able to give us grace. We can come boldly to that throne and find mercy and obtain grace that we need. The judgment seat in heaven is really the mercy seat that we can come to. But this throne, 
There's no grace here. There's no mercy here. There's no power here. It's an attempt to counterfeit what God is doing in heaven. So where did the church actually receive this throne from? Well, let's now go to uh, the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 13. Revelation chapter 13. And uh, let's look here at verse 2. Revelation chapter 13 and verse 2. So last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 13 and verse 2. There it says, And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard. His feet were as the feet of a bear, his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. Now the word seat here in this verse is the Greek word thronos, where we get our word throne from. So it says there, that the dragon gave him his power and his throne and great authority. Now, who is the dragon? Well, if you jump over to chapter 12 and verse 9, it tells us that that great dragon is Satan, the devil and Satan. So the dragon gave him his power and his throne. And of course, the dragon also represents uh, pagan Rome, in chapter 12. Uh, that's the power that Satan worked through there to try and destroy Christ at his birth. So pagan Rome gave papal Rome its throne. Lucifer gave papal Rome its throne as he worked through, um, through pagan Rome. So how did this actually happen historically? How did this actually happen historically? Here you see a picture of the Lateran Palace. It's in Rome, and it was once the residence of Constantine. It was once his home. Constantine the Great, the, great, the ruler there of the Roman Empire in the 300s, this was his house. It was once his residence, and he lived there for many, uh, for many years. And then he built this uh, basilica called the Lateran Basilica. Uh, actually, it's the Arc Basilica. It's the, the greatest basilica in uh, the Church of Rome. So he built this next door right beside it. The, the, the buildings are attached. And this Lateran Palace, the, his residence and this uh, church here, were given to the Pope at the time of uh, the Bishop of Rome, at the time uh, of the 300s. And it became the residence of the Pope over uh, the centuries. <clears throat> You'll notice at the top of this church, can you see there a woman? One of the statues is a woman on the, uh, she's just the second one in from the right. And notice she has something in her hand, a cup in her hand. Does that remind you of anything? Revelation chapter 7, or 17 rather, where this woman with a cup in her hand, sitting right here on the top of this basilica. At the base of the basilica, and uh, maybe I'll go back here, there's uh, the pillars of this church, and right at the base of the, of the pillars in the middle, uh, the, there's kind of four or sets of columns here, the two roundish columns right in the middle. At the base of these columns is this inscription. And uh, it's in Latin, so I'm not going to uh, attempt to try and, and translate them. I know our translator would probably have difficulty translating this into English, or, or into Chinese, rather. Uh, so we'll just look at what is the English translation of this. Well, here it is. The sacred Lateran church, mother and head of all the churches of the city and of the world. All the churches. This church here is seen by Rome as the greatest 
church in the entire world. It's the mother that harkens back to Revelation 17. And it's the head of all the churches, not just in the city of Rome, but of the world. And inside this church, right at the very back of the church, there's a throne. And on this throne is when the Pope sits here and speaks from this throne. He's, it, it, um, he's said to be speaking ex cathedra, which is Latin. That means from the chair or from the throne. And whenever he speaks there, he claims to be the representative of Christ here upon the earth. He's the vicar of Christ, the one who takes the place of Christ upon the earth. That's what the word vicar means. Uh, vicar is like vice or vice president. So we could say the vicar of the president is the vice president, the one who takes the place of the president when the president is not available. So the vicar of Christ is the one who takes the place of Christ when Christ is somewhere else. Right now, he's in heaven. And so from this throne, from this throne here, is the throne that was given by Constantine. And this is the throne that the dragon gave to the papal power. Jesus came, though, to refute the claims of Satan. Jesus claim, came to refute those claims. And there was a monumental struggle for the throne of the universe, the throne of God. Satan, however, claims rulership of the world through the papacy. And this is the throne he attempts to set up as the one to rule all the churches, not only of the city, but of the world. And so Daniel chapter 8 and verse 11 said, as this little horn exalts itself, it will cast down the place of the sanctuary, cast down the throne of God, and set up itself on that throne to rule the earth according to his will. Now we look at uh, Revelation chapter 13 and verse 6. Notice Revelation 13 verse 6. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. The same as Daniel saw, the attack on the sanctuary, the attack on sanctuary, the attack on God's throne and God's law, we see it playing out here upon this earth where this power, the papal power, is going to blaspheme God blaspheme his name, and blaspheme his tabernacle. This is no uh, make-believe contest. This is something that actually is taking place here upon this earth. And all the trappings, all the ceremonies, the throne shows us that it's real. An attack on God, and by an extension, it's also an attack on us. Because not only is Satan contending for the throne of God to rule the earth according to his will here, he's also contending for another throne. And that throne is within us, the throne of our heart. It also is being contested. Satan wants to take us off of that throne and place himself there. But at the same time, there is the God of heaven who is seeking to sit on that throne and to live in us and be the one who leads and guides us. Go with me to chapter 3 of this same book here, Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3 and verse 20. And notice there it says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. The sanctuary of the soul, to open that door to Jesus Christ and accept him as our Messiah, as not only our Savior, 
but our Lord, the one who sits upon the throne of our heart. He wants an undivided throne, doesn't want to share it with Lucifer, doesn't want to share it with Satan, and we decide who will sit upon the throne of our heart. You know, it's quite simple to open the door to Jesus Christ. It's simply bowing our heads, uh, kneeling at our bedside, and asking Jesus Christ to sit upon the throne of our heart, to forgive our sins, to ask for his forgiveness. And as we ask for his forgiveness, to invite him to come and live in our life, to lead us and to guide us, and to give us power to keep him on the throne and keep Lucifer away from the throne. And in return, notice what God has promised to do in the very next verse. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. Here we see no higher honor than to sit with Christ on the throne of the universe. That very throne that Satan sought to usurp, that very throne that he made war against with all of the angels that followed him there in, seven, in heaven, that very throne that he attempts to uh, set up here on earth as his throne, that very throne, but that by deception and cruelty he sought to usurp, he sought to take, is going to be given to you and to me, the saints of the Most High. As we bow our, before Jesus Christ, as we give him our life, as we allow him to sit upon the throne of our heart, he's going to allow us to sit with him on his throne, to rule the universe, no higher honor. It doesn't come by opposing God. It comes by inviting God. Remember ye not that when I was with you, I told you these things. Paul told about the oppressor, the one who was going to oppose God. So that's what we've looked at today, or this evening, tonight. We've looked at the opposer. Over the next couple of evenings, we're going to look at the one who is being opposed. We're going to look at the Messiah, and we're going to spend our time over the next few days uh, looking at the Messiah, Jesus Christ, in Daniel chapter 9. So until we meet again, I just appeal to you to open that door and invite Jesus Christ into your life, that he might sit upon the throne of your heart, and that you then, in turn, will sit with him on the throne of the universe as one with him. Let's bow our heads and pray together. Dear Father in heaven, what a privilege and an honor you hold out to each of us that we might sit with you in your throne, the throne of the universe. We have very faint conception of the beauty, the glories, the honor that you want to give your people. And would we trade that for a few trinkets, a few baubles, a, a, a few things here in this life? That would be a terrible bargain. Lord, we want to accept Jesus as our Savior today and follow him and be with him when he comes again. And we thank you for being with us. In Jesus' name, amen. It was a privilege being with you, and we will see you tomorrow evening. Thank you, Pastor Kim, for the beautiful message. And I believe everybody are blessed by it. So before we dismiss, we have a few reminders for all the participants. So the number one reminder is um, tomorrow we will continue the workshop with Pastor Kim. 
at the same time, 9 p.m. until 10 p.m. And the second reminder, every morning, AOI will have a united prayer. So we divide it into two. The first one will be in Chinese, which they will have on 6 o'clock in the morning until 6.45 in the morning. So I invited all our Chinese friends to join us in the morning for the United Prayer. And the second one will be in English. It will be held on 6.50 in the morning until 6.45. So yeah, join us. Every, it will be held daily until 31st of August it will, yeah, throughout the AY conference. And the last reminder for tonight is join us tomorrow for the workshop. And the workshop for tomorrow will be shared by David Fang, a founder of NN Healthcare. And the topic that will he share that he will share is ready to meet your God. So six o'clock in the evening tomorrow. See you and God bless. <laughs>